friends, welcome to Sean's Retroverse. This is Sean, and today you can see I have my Commodore 64 set up and ready to roll. Why? Well, number one, it's my Excalibur. I love my C64, I always have, but in particular today, I actually have something new to show. What I just received in the mail a week or two ago was my 1541 Ultimate 2 Plus. Fresh from uh, the Netherlands, Gideon's Logic Architectures is the designer, and uh, he actually sent me some pretty cool stuff in the mail. So let's take a look and see what we have. I actually ordered the cartridge itself uh, in red, and then also the data cassette adapter. Uh, so that's an additional purchase there. It also comes with a small one foot long jumper IEC cable, the serial cable that goes from here to your 64. And he also included an eight gigabyte USB drive just for good measure. So that's uh, everything that came in the box other than the order form. Uh, and so let's go ahead and uh, take a closer look. This is the 1541 Ultimate 2 Plus. As you can see, this is the red version, but it also comes in three other colors, white, black, and clear. On the front, you'll see the Ultimate 2 Plus logo embossed on the front of the uh, cartridge case. Uh, it does appear to be injection molded plastic and of good quality. It has a hefty feel to it and uh, feels very solid. As you can see, there's a speaker grill on the front. That is listed as an optional uh, speaker accessory. Right now, there's no hardware mounted behind that, but you could possibly do some sort of expansions or mod in the future. Uh, there are four uh, cartridge activity lights on the front. The two on the left are for your virtual 1541 floppy drive. This one over here is the power light, the one on the left. It'll light up green. Uh, you can also, I've seen it uh, light up amber as well, and I believe the color changes uh, to reflect the status of whether or not there's an image loaded into the virtual drive. The second one is the drive activity light. That's the red light that you see on the front of your 1541 floppy. Flashes if there's an error. Uh, and also just comes on when the drive is in use. The third light is a cartridge image light. It lets you know that there's a cartridge image loaded into the Ultimate 2 Plus. And the fourth light is an activity light. It lets you know there's internal activity in the Ultimate 2, such as writing to the USB stick or uh, holding a disk image in memory. On the uh, right side, we'll see that there are three USB ports. There's two USB Type A ports and one micro USB on the side. Uh, these can be used for USB sticks, external hard drives, external CD-ROM drives, uh, whatever you prefer there. The micro is listed as uh, external power. New to this unit is the Ethernet port. It is a 100 base T Ethernet. I believe that allows you to log in through Telnet. Uh, that might be actually kind of cool for demos or something like that. On the other side, we have the IEC port. This is the port that is the physical port of the virtual 1541 uh, floppy drive. So this uses the small one foot jumper uh, that came in the package to plug into the IEC port where your 1541 floppy drive normally is connected. Uh, we have another USB port which can be used for USB devices uh, or hard drives, but it's primarily designed for the cartridge adapter. Uh, and this is so you can read tape files and, and whatnot. Notice this is a blue port, which means normally 3.0 or USB 3.0. However, you should not use USB 3.0 devices in here because the extra conductors inside this plug are really for the data that goes to the data cassette port. Uh, so to risk damaging your USB 3.0 device or possibly the cartridge itself, it's best to use that port mainly for this or for other USB 2.0 devices. Here we also have an audio output and an audio input port. Uh, and I believe that is for virtual SID, uh, or you can do stereo SID with the virtual SID that's inside of the unit. Uh, the input port is unused as of this firmware revision, which is 3.0C. The back we can see the buttons. We'll look at them from this angle because this is how you'll see them in the 64. The left button is the freezer button. That's a special function button that allows you to use the freezer cart images. So basically if you have a freezer cartridge image, which there's several already loaded on here, uh, like Retro Replay uh, as the default for instance, but there's also Action Replay and others, this gives you the freezer button. What that does, if you're unaware, is it brings up a, an additional menu. What you can do is 
uh, write memory to disk, you can do pokes and peaks, you can use an MLM or machine language monitor for examining the the actual assembly uh, for the program. The middle button is the actual menu button for the Ultimate 2 itself. Uh, and so that in that menu you can load cartridge images, load disk images, uh, you can also configure the cartridge. The right button is a reset button. It simply just gives you a reset button for your 64. Those buttons can be configured in the menu to be any order you want, so they're not specifically in that order. So that's a nice feature, you can configure that. On the back of the cartridge is a label, serial number, barcode. It's put together with Phillips head screws, uh, so it's easy to service the unit. You can There's a battery inside that you can replace for the real-time clock. This is a piezo speaker, which is mounted in the back of the uh, cartridge casing, or the cartridge shell, and that makes the virtual 1541 drive sounds. Again, those sounds can be turned off if you like, if they bother you. I actually find they're actually useful to listen to because you can actually hear an audible feedback of what the drive could be doing. Uh, it's not necessary, but it's kind of a cool feature and it kind of gives you that emulated accuracy of what the actual drive would sound like if it were hooked up. So all in all, it's a pretty good thing. The one thing that is missing on this cartridge is a micro SD card slot. As we can see, there's none in here. And I thought there may be one mounted internally, but there really isn't. That is the only weakness I really see for here, but uh, to make up for that, Gideon gave us extra USB ports, so we can just use more USB devices. That's pretty cool, uh, except that the USB devices tend to, of course, stick out of the side of the cartridge uh, by a little bit. I have tried to use a low-profile type adapter here, or a low-profile USB stick, which doesn't stick out that far. The only problem with this one, which is a 16 gig stick, the USB um, or does not recognize this USB stick in the Ultimate 2 Plus. But that's okay. I could hopefully find another one or maybe a future firmware update will fix that. So all in all, that's the outside. Let's take a look at the inside. Now for the inside of the unit, it is held together with four Phillips head screws, which I have actually already removed. Uh, no reason to sit here and watch me take out screws in this video. But we'll go ahead and flip the unit over and show the insides. We'll just remove the case. Uh, the back of the case, as you can see, there's no speaker mounted in the grill. Uh, it has uh, light tube extensions for the uh, LEDs that are uh, on the PCB. Uh, other than that, it's just a basic plastic uh, injection molded shell. Very nice, well constructed. Uh, when we take the board out of the way, the bottom of the, the shell is also pretty much the same with the exception that there is a uh, small surface mount uh, piezo speaker in there, and that speaker gives us the virtual drive sounds. You can see there's little spring-loaded contacts uh, right here and there on the corners that make uh, contact with the actual back of the board itself. Uh, somewhere right about, well, should be right here, those two contacts right there, the speaker outputs. And so, that aside, we'll move the bottom of the shell away and take a closer look at the board itself. It's a multi-layer board, it appears. Uh, everything looks very good, all surface mount technology. The IEC port, the audio ports, the USB port. There is what appears to be uh, some sort of expansion port here. It looks like it may be an internal USB port, maybe so you could mod it or do some sort of USB. There's also some unmarked contacts right here. Maybe that's for soldering in something. It seems to be pretty close to the IEC port, uh, but I see no traces on either side uh, right off. Well, there's a couple little traces there it looks like. So I'm not sure if that's used for some sort of modding purpose, but uh, they are there. Um, when we look also here, we can see that it actually sports an Altera Cyclone 4 FPGA, or Field Programmable Gate Array. This actually is a allows the hardware to actually be updated by a firmware patch. Um, pretty cool. We can actually uh, expect that's probably what gives us some SID emulation and some other things like that. Uh, there are a couple other ROM chips here. We see revision A. 432, um, and the Ultimate 2 logo is listed, you know, printed right on the 
circuit board there. On the bottom there is a CR2032 button cell lithium battery. That is for the real-time clock. The real-time clock is used for uh, when you write files back to the USB, they'll have the correct timestamp. There may be other uses for that. Um, maybe there's a way to transfer that clock into the C64 so when you boot the C64 it has the right time of day in it. I'm not really sure, but that would be something special in the software. Uh, there do seem to be a few bodges here, uh, some resistor bodges, but the work is nice, neat, and clean. Uh, and seems to uh, maybe have just been intentional, or it may be that these traces were left off during the design of the PCB. Otherwise, though, they don't seem to get in the way, and the work is clean, so I really don't mind that. Uh, we can see that, uh, well, that's pretty much everything I wanted to show you inside. There's not a whole lot else to look at. Uh, and so let's go ahead and put this back together, and we'll do a demonstration. Okay, real quick, we'll just kind of go over setting up the cartridge. We have the Ultimate 2 Plus here. We're going to put our USB stick in there, provided so graciously by Gideon. I'm also going to take the data cassette adapter and plug in the short USB 3.0 jumper to it. Uh, we'll go ahead and plug that into the port on the side. I'm going to plug in the short IEC uh, jumper. Uh, while we're at it here, I'm going to disconnect the IEC from my 1541 floppy drive. I'm going to put the cartridge in. Plug the data cassette port adapter in, like so, and we'll plug in the IEC since this is replacing the 1541 floppy I've got connected right now. We turn it on. We're greeted with a couple little clicks. A little bit of virtual drive sound, and we're ready to go. So now, let's look at the actual features of the cartridge itself. Now, I'm an American, so I have an NTSC C64. And this, of course, is a European product. So it was really designed with PAL C64s in mind. And so, I wasn't really terribly surprised, but a little disappointed when I first turned on my 64 and saw NTSC C64, but we have a PAL ROM and a warning message. Uh, and so that worried me just a little bit. However, that's not the Ultimate 2 Plus. The Ultimate 2 Plus works just fine with NTSC C64s. This is the Cyberpunk's retro replay cartridge image that was made in the early 2000s. That's the default cartridge image that was loaded on my Ultimate 2 Plus. So it's really not a problem to change that. There's several different cartridge Im images to choose from, including the NTSC version of this particular image as well. So the way we get into the Ultimate 2 Plus menu is hitting the middle button. That brings up the Ultimate 2 screen, 2 Plus screen, uh, which has USB 0 and Net 0. So when you have a USB drive installed, that's what you have. And right now I don't have network set up. I plan to maybe do that in a future video if there's enough interest for that, but we're just going to look at the disk uh, features right now. So you can hit the enter key, which brings up a menu, uh, and then you can navigate from there. But I also find it's easier to just navigate using the cursor keys because you don't get those menus. Cursor to the right will bring up navigation to the right, and cursor to the left by holding the shift key, and cursor takes you backwards. Uh, the same thing for up versus down. Very much the same way the cursor key works in BASIC on the C64. If you're not familiar with it, you turn it on, you can send the cursor key around. You do have to use shift for the up and left directions on the cursor keys. So with that being said, we'll look at the function keys, which play an important part in the cartridge. F7 is the page down, so F1 is page up. Uh, that's fairly intuitive. Uh, F3, it says right in the corner, is your help screen, which tells you some of the options on the menu. And cursor back from that. And then F5 is the action menu, and that shows you some of the actions that you can do. Uh, F2, which if you're also familiar with the C64, F1 and Shift is F2, so you'll see the Shift is on the bottom of the keys. That brings up our configuration. The configuration, you can do things like set your clock. 
Uh, and so we set that for today's date and today's time. We have to, in some menus, instead of cursor backward, which changes the option on the screen, we have to hit the delete key or the run stop key to back up. Uh, so that's, if one doesn't work, you have to try the other. Uh, and so the options seem to be set up that way. You have audio output settings. Uh, this is where we can turn on and off the virtual drive sounds or configure stereo SID or our virtual SID chip. And again, we have to hit backspace key. Software IEC settings, this is for IEC devices. So there's an IEC drive and printer. The printer is actually another feature of this cartridge. I don't have a need for it, but when you have Commodore software that prints to the printer, you can actually use the Ultimate 2 Plus as a virtual printer. You can print to it and it will actually save that as an image file to the USB drive. That's a pretty cool feature. It's not enabled by default, at least not on my system, on my cartridge. Uh, but it is there if you want it. C64 and cartridge settings. This is the most widely used um, configuration menu that I use. Here's where you can set your cartridge. So the default that I had it installed with is the 3.8 PAL version of Retro Replay. However, Retro Replay version 3.8 ANTSC is also available. This is also where we can set up RAM expansion units uh, and do some other uh, fine-tuning type controls. This is also where you can set up your button order. If you don't like freezer menu reset, you can set it to something different. The user interface settings is really just where you can set your background and foreground color and text color and selected items. So it's really just for uh, what color you want your menu to be. It's nice to have that customized uh, option. The next option sets up your virtual 1541 drive. Here's where you can disable the drive if you want. I'm not sure why anyone would want to do that, but you can. You can set your drive number, just like a, a real 1541, to 8, 9, 10, or 11. Uh, you can also select which ROM you want. You can use the regular original CBM 1541 ROM, the 1541C ROM, the 1541-2 ROM, or use a custom ROM. The default is 1541-2. You can also configure if you want additional RAM boards that were sometimes installed in 1541 floppies. Uh, there are some other menu options in here for that that are for the advanced user. Network setting is where you can set up the network port on the uh, Ultimate 2 Plus. With that being said, we'll back out of here and take a look at navigating some of the games. Now here, let's take a look at some cart images. You can actually load up cartridge images. Uh, and what I'll show here is like an original cartridge image from 1983, Dig Dug. You just select it and run cart. It will reboot. And now we have Dig Dug. You can also play modern cart images such as Bruce Lee 2. You run the cart. Here we go. And you can start up the game. It also is compatible with Easy Flash images such as Prince of Persia that was released uh, a few years ago for the C64. You can run that cart. And it runs like a champ. And I will say this, for these games, it is way different playing them on original hardware. It is a beautiful game on original hardware. It plays beautifully and it plays as smoothly as any other version that I've played. Ouch. Now, like any other Commodore game, you have to press up to jump. 
But that's typically par for the course. So now, to unload a cartridge image, I really haven't found an easy way to do it other than power cycling, or you can hit F5 and go to Reboot C64. Now you'll notice we had switched over to the NTSC ROM for Cyberpunk's Retro Replay. NTSC, NTSC, and there's no warning. So again, works just fine on an NTSC C64. However, what I usually like to use is the Epix Fast Loader cartridge. And we can power cycle and it boots up with fast load cartridge. So I'm going to show now how to load disk images. Disk images uh, will go right in. We can load up a game. Well, let's load up Mule for instance. So what you can do is you can hit enter and you can mount the disk or you can run it. Now running it as you can see, we'll actually reboot the 64 without a cartridge image and then try to load. So be aware, you may lose your fast loading capabilities by doing that. What I prefer to do is I just hit the reset button, is I will prefer to actually mount the disk. Then I can load it like a normal disk. Fast load cartridge image shortcut is run, stop, and Commodore key. So I hit those. And we now fast load Mule. And even with fast load, it still takes a few moments to load a, a game image up. But here's Mule. Now I'm going to show you an advanced feature. And it doesn't work with all games, but it works with some. So we're going to look at, say, Roland's Rat Race here. Now, if you hit Enter, you get, it's not immediately clear because you get this menu. You can go to View, for instance, because you think you want to view the disk, and there's nothing here. Uh, and so, of course, that doesn't do a whole lot for us. But if you cursor right, you'll actually go into the disk image. Now, the difference here, this is Roland's Rat Race. You can see it is a single... PRG file, 147 blocks. And then it's got a high score file, but that's, that's just minor. And so you can actually go into here and run it directly. Now what this does is, since it's a single program file, it will load it directly into memory. It's called DMA or Direct Memory Access, or DMA Load. Uh, and Run is actually the option that does that. And you can see it's already unloading, it's decompressing, you can tell from the uh, color bars on the uh, quarter there. And then we go through our normal intros and then it does a little more decompression. I think it's going to ask us for trainers, as many game images have trainers in them as well. Uh, so we'll just say trainers and no to everything. And here is... Roland's Rat Race for the C64. This is a really fun game back in the day. Plus it's got some pretty cool music to go with. Whoops. Haha, -ha, got the guy. You got, so you got glue packs and you can kind of glue these little boot guys in place to keep them from hurting you. But again, that shows direct memory access loading. It loads as fast as a cartridge does. We'll also show, let's see here, Mayhem and Monsterland. This was the last commercially released game, uh, but it was released in Europe, and it did not work correctly on NTSC C64s, but there was a fixed version, and that's what this fix at the end of it says. And so we can actually mount this disc in, now, when you mount a disc, it doesn't interrupt what the C64 does. So really what you should do when you mount the disc is hit your F5 button and go in and reboot the 64. Otherwise, you'll have to remount it. But now, since I have it loaded, I can just load it up.
And again, you can see even with the fast load cartridge, you can hear the stepper motor going faster than it normally would. It still takes a minute to load these games. And of course it takes a minute to decompress them as well. What I would like to see is images where we don't have to decompress. Uh, so you can just go right into the games through direct memory load. Uh, but I don't think we're there quite yet. After we get the splash at the beginning. And we'll say no to all the trainers. And then it loads up Jelly Land. Now it really kind of surprises me with this game being as late as it was, the last commercially released game, that it does not have a fast load for the level load. But it doesn't take a long time. It just seems like they would have taken the time to have that fast load in there, but maybe it just took up too much memory and they couldn't fit it. Who knows? But here it is. Now, of course, this game is known for using every C64 programming trick in the book. Things like non-standard colors, parallax scrolling, um, they're all options in this game, or they're all put into this game. Very nicely implemented as well. Like any other Commodore game, you usually hit press up to jump because there's only one button. And they never figured a way to really expand that very well with the joystick, so one button and pressing up. So Mayhem and Monster Land, everyone. The only other thing I did want to show on this uh, review is the ability to actually play SID files. Now we can go back, go into our SID folder here, and play um, any sort of SID file. It is a little bit uh, featureless as far as a SID player goes, uh, meaning you have to, if you load up the wrong song, you really can't go to the next song, there's no next or back button on the player, you have to hit the middle button to go back to the menu and pick a different song from the menu. But, the cool thing is, you can play your SID files directly on your actual SID hardware. That is a cool feature. The thing I find is very interesting about it, Something I noticed here, for instance, this is timed for PAL. When the clock is unknown, it defaults to PAL because SID is pretty much a PAL type format. But it's playing at PAL speed on an NTSC C64. Now, I don't know if they wrote the uh, SID player to actually use CIA timings to kind of get that 50 frame per second rather than use a uh, some sort of raster interrupt, but that's... Uh, I thought was interesting. I don't know that it's pitch corrected for uh, NTSC versus PAL, uh, and so you may get some variation there. I really haven't checked to see, but I did find that was interesting that it actually uh, recreates PAL timings on an NTSC 64. Uh, but again, it's not the best SID player I've ever seen, but it, it definitely plays on original hardware, which is a big plus. And so that is really about all I was going to show today. Uh, look for future videos. We're going to hook up the 1541 floppy drive and copy some floppy disks. That's actually what I've been in the progress of doing in this particular folder, backing up all of my original floppies. Uh, I will mention that it is possible to do this. Uh, you need to use some copy software. Uh, there are still some bugs in the Ultimate 2 Plus uh, for version 3.0. When you hit the F5 action menu, there's an Ultra Copy 8 and an Ultra Copy 9. Uh, as far as I'm 
told right now, those do not work. Uh, but when they do work, they work great. Uh, so it'll probably be a future firmware revision when he gets some of the other bugs worked out. Uh, one of the other problems I've had with it is uh, working with G64 images. I can create an image, but when I try to write a disk image to G64, it just kind of hangs and does nothing. Uh, well, it flashes the light on the USB stick, uh, and I've let it set for probably 30 to 45 minutes before, and it never quite finishes. Uh, and so it just basically leaves you with an empty G64 image. Uh, and so that's another little bug, but hopefully those will be worked out in future firmware revisions. Uh, and so other than that, uh, and of course my low profile USB stick doesn't actually work uh, with it either. And hopefully that's something that can be fixed in the future where I can find another low profile stick to work with that. But the one that Gideon provided is actually not the longest as well. You can see it's fairly short, so it's not a game breaker. So. I do enjoy that as well. So let's go ahead and wrap this video up. So 1541 Ultimate 2 Plus, two thumbs up from this guy right here. Uh, it plays cartridge images, SID files, it plays disk images, the D64 and G64 image files, a couple other formats, tape images. It can copy disks from your 1541 to the Ultimate or Ultimate to the 1541 if you want physical disks. So all in all, I would say it's a really good bargain. I do, uh, I do actually like the cartridge. It fits nicely in the back of the C64. Uh, two little bugs that I found with it. I do have trouble writing G64 files for special format disks. Uh, it just hangs on right to the uh, USB drive, but I have no reason to think that won't be fixed on a future firmware update. Uh, also, uh, the one thing I did kind of find was a little bit of a bummer is my low profile SanDisk USB drive. It didn't recognize. Uh, but I have got reports from friends across the pond there in the UK that uh, the Lexar uh, USB disks work just fine. So maybe I'll order one of those. They're also low profile and uh, that way I can keep it right in the uh, cartridge without having it sticking way off out of the side. Uh, other than that, I um, couldn't be more thrilled with this purchase. It's great. And so, thanks for tuning in. Like and subscribe. And uh, this has been the Sean's Retroverse.